Are you one who gives yourself permission to excel? Because most of the time, the problem we have is that we are not giving ourselves the right for us to excel. As little girls, we were taught so many things and we, they got embedded in our heads and we grew up into adults. And guess what? They have remained in our heads. And over time, we are always seeking for validation. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody here on the Thrivers Group, I want to introduce you all to Aisha Yesufu. Aisha calls herself an active Nigerian citizen, an active. So Aisha, that's the first question I'm going to ask you later. I want to understand what you mean by an active Nigerian citizen, but we'll come to that later. She's an active Nigerian citizen who demands for good governance, demands for good governance. She's unapologetic about her stance in fighting for justice and equality. Aisha is a businesswoman. She, you'll hear a lot about that. Aisha is a businesswoman who teaches financial literacy. So get ready. She teaches financial literacy to empower people to be financially independent and also have a voice for good governance. She's the co-convener of the Bring Back Our Girls movement, an advocacy group um, that brings that brought attention to the abduction of over 200 girls from the secondary school in Chibok, Nigeria on 14th of April, 2014, by the terrorist group Boko Haram. Aisha Yusufu has also been at the forefront of the um, NSAS movement, which drew attention to the excesses of controversial police units in the Nigerian police force called the Special Anti-Robbie Squad. Yusufu has said she would not leave the fight against NSAS protest in Nigeria for her children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Thrivers Group for the first time, and hopefully not the last time, Mrs. Aisha Yusufu. Aisha, how are you doing? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Thank Aisha, you so you. much, Aaron, for having me. Thank you once uh, again. Fantastic words. I'm like, who is he talking about? <laughs> anyway, before I go on, I think I need to do my own gratitude this day. I'm grateful yeah. for being crazy. I mean, I'm grateful <laughs> for not even caring what people think about and just living my life uh, the way I want to live it on my own terms. I'm grateful for the fact that uh, I learned early enough to just be myself and mm. be unapologetic about myself and that the world should be the one to come to my standard, not me living towards the standard of the society. Wow. So for me, I'm really grateful for that. Thank you so much. Wow, let me ask you a question yeah. before I get out, just in case I don't yeah. I don't get I don't remember then. So how did you feel the day you woke up and you found out that the government was suing you? What was your reaction? Oh okay so in this case it's not even the government that is suing me. It's actually uh an individual. But oh, of course okay. most people say that it's, yeah it's sort of like stamp I well uh, one of the things that we have I have with my husband most times when he comes back and he's like Oh, when he comes back in the evening, say, "Oh, they have not arrested you yet." <laughs> ah, you know. So it's something that we've been waiting. I've been waiting for for a very long time. I've I've put a lot of things in place in terms of uh, even my businesses. I had to make it's just some, some of my accounts that I was the sig uh, sole signatory. I had to make sure that I'm no longer the sole signatory and anything, so that in case either. I'm, I'm arrested or whatever happens, they put a bullet through my head. We know that certain things are not going to suffer. So it, it's something that will be used to. So Aisha, let, let me get out of the stream. I just allow you. <laughs> You're already shooting. Let me just get out. I just allow you. I'll be back in 30 minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron, uh, for having me. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me uh, to be here. And uh, thank you so much uh, for those of you that are joining. And um, you want to hear this crazy woman uh, as uh, as speak? Uh, like uh, earlier on, I think Ella was talking about the fact that why do I call myself an active Nigerian citizen? So for me, basically, I don't like uh, I don't like labels the way people do labels, and I'm going to talk about that uh, as as we go on. So they give you this name: oh, she's an activist; oh, she's an advocate for this; oh, she's that, and then you find out that you're trying to live towards the names they are giving you, and they put you in a box with their with their labels and then their expectations is what you're doing. So I, I never wanted that even as a child. I never wanted that label where I'm called uh, a good child and all of that. So it's one of when I say active Nigerian citizen, I'm just a citizen who is not passive, who is who is putting an eye in what's happening in our country and I'm interested and I'm speaking out on it. So that makes me an active citizen rather than a passive citizen 
who never does anything, who is not interested in what is happening in the country. But anyway, let's come back to business. Uh, today, basically, uh, the, uh, I've been asked to talk re, uh, here uh, over, uh, there's no specific uh, 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 topic uh, per se, but generally I'm going to talk about, you know, sort of like uh, what it is just being yourself either as, as a woman and just owning your space and living your life. But before I go on, I'm going to read out something that I wrote on the day that the at, in, at the Senate and the National Assembly, there was this thing called the Equality Bill and it was thrown out. And I said, my name is Aisha Yesufu and I happen to be a human being with the reproductive organs of a, a female, so I am called a woman. When I demand for equality, I'm not demanding to change my womanhood to manhood. That would be unfair to the me that I am. When I demand for equality, I'm merely asking equity of treatment. When I demand for equality, I want to be looked at as a human being with all her five senses and an accompanying brain, and not as a toy to be toyed with. When I demand for equality, I'm not saying I want to beat up a man. I'm just saying I should not be seen as one to be beaten up. When I demand for equality, I'm not saying I want to take over a man's job. I'm merely saying I want to have my own job and not hand out. When I demand for equality, I'm not saying I want the pay of a man. I'm just saying I, des I, I deserve to be paid based on what I bring to the table. When I demand for equality, I'm not saying that the boy child born should be frowned at. I'm only saying that the girl child born should be heralded with joy. When I demand for equality, I'm not saying that the boy child shouldn't be sent to school. I'm only saying that the girl child has a place in the classroom. When I demand for equality, I'm not saying that the wife should be above the husband. I'm only saying that the wife should have a place in the partnership. When I demand for equality, I'm not saying that husbands have to do the cooking. I'm only saying that whoever wants to should be allowed to do the cooking. When I demand for equality, I'm not saying that men should be controlled by women. I'm just saying that women have rights too. When I demand for equality, I'm not saying that men sh should be disinherited. I'm only saying that women have a right to inherit and be inherited from. When I demand for equality, I'm not saying that I'm better than you, that because I'm a woman, I'm better than you. No. I'm only saying that you should not be afraid of who I am. At the end of the day, my demand for equality does not take anything away from you. So why all the bad belly? Why all the bad belly that when simply women said in Nigeria that they wanted equality, they wanted to be seen as human beings, they wanted to be treated right, and then all of a sudden it's as if hell broke loose. No. That's not what we're saying. So today I'm going to come to you and say to you as the woman who, because of your reproductive organs, is called a woman. They could have called it any name. It could have been a man. It could have been whatever. Some people call me all sorts of names. I'm like, it's OK. Whatever label you want to give me, that's perfectly OK. If you go to my Twitter handle or my bio, there's something I say there. I said, I am me. I don't do label. I am me. And I say it as, a, as it is. My mom says in my court, nobody wins. And that you will either love me or hate me. And it, it, whichever one is perfectly OK. The reason why that is perfectly OK, because I have so much love for myself. And as long as you love yourself, you give yourself all the love there is. Any other love is just jara. For those of you who are not Nigeria, probably don't understand what jara means. How do I explain it? It's just an addition. It's not the main thing. You know, after you finish eating your meal, you're like, okay, can I just have a little, a little bit of serving? Let me taste again. That's what it's going to be like. But before we go on, the first thing I'm going to talk about is mindset. Mindset. What's your mindset? How do you see yourself? The first question, of course, is who are you? 
It's always a question I say to people, try as much as possible to find out who you are, to be at peace with yourself, to be able to sit with yourself and have a conversation with yourself, to be able to look in the mirror and be happy at what you see. And when you're with your thoughts, you are okay with your thoughts. And you also know that these are your strengths and these are your weaknesses and they're perfectly okay because in all of it, they are you. You know, recently I had a, I had a picture uh, taken of me. Someone came for an interview and then they took a picture and they sent the pictures to me. Different, uh, there were different shots. When I looked at the pictures, I'm like, who is that? Guess what they did? They removed all the spots. I have spots on my face. Sometimes people say, why are you not covering them? Sometimes people say to me, oh, why are you not getting either makeup or get something that will ensure the girl? I said, no, because my spots are part of me. Some of them, I've had them for over 40 years. I was less than 10, maybe between the age six and seven when I had my, my chicken paws. And then I had these scars all over my face from my chicken paws. They are who I am. You don't need to take them out. I feel beautiful. I feel beautiful with my spots because I've understood who I am. I know who I am. I'm this amazing, crazy human being who has spots on her face and that's perfectly okay. And I didn't need any validation. So it's very important to first of all, know who you are. And then that mindset, are you one who gives yourself permission to excel? Because most of the time, the problem we have is that we are not giving ourselves the right for us to excel. As little girls, we were taught so many things and we, they got embedded in our heads and we grew up into adults. And guess what? They have remained in our heads. And over time, we are always seeking for validation. And I come to the question, are you in love with yourself? Have you ever looked at this whole gorgeous human being that you are and just fall in love with yourself and just love yourself, cherish yourself, like yourself? Many people will say that's weird, right? But you need to do that. Before even anybody can love you, you have to first of all love yourself. You have to know that you are worth it. A lot of people, even when they see love, because of their mindset, they don't think they are worth that love. <laughs> they don't get it. You need to be exactly that. You need to be you. You need to be you. You need to love yourself. Whatever it is you have in you, love yourself for who you are. That's who you are. It's not any other person. Are you enough for yourself? That's another question that you need to be able to know. Most people are looking for another person to complete them. No, nobody's ever going to complete you. You have to complete yourself. When you complete yourself, then any other person coming in is an addition. Because you find that a, a lot of people who, first of all, they don't even love themselves. So when you don't love yourself, how is somebody else going to love you? How are you going to know that you are deserving of whatever it is that you get? That when you get an affection coming in, there are people who self-sabotage. What do they do? Even when somebody loves them or even when they're being accepted, because they haven't accepted themselves, they're always self-sabotaging. So you need to know, are you enough for yourself? Is it okay when you're sitting down, just you and your thoughts, and you feel great and amazing? Can you sit there and you're dancing, even without music, for you to find yourself and you're dancing? And let me digress a little bit. Earlier today, when I was just preparing lunch uh, for, for, for myself, I went downstairs and I was like dancing. And I said I was going to ask a question. I was going to tweet it out. I haven't tweeted it out yet because I wanted to ask, are there people who can, who dance without music because I do that a lot. Be quiet, guess what? I'm in love with myself. I love myself. I'm happy with myself. I'm fulfilled. I'm enough for me and I can make myself happy. And that's the third question I have for you. Can you make yourself happy? These things are very, very uh, important. Your capacity to be able to make yourself happy. Your happiness should not be dependent on anybody. Your happiness should be dependent on you. A lot of people come to me uh, for those who follow me on Twitter, you know, my page is crazy. I say to people, I don't even know how you guys follow me because I wouldn't even follow myself. It, it, it's, it's a madhouse. There are always people who come to attack, people who insult me, people who call me all, 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 sorts, of, all, all sorts of names and everything. And people are surprised that I don't get worked up. And I say to them, the only person who is allowed to make me angry is myself. 
and I choose what I get angry over. So somebody is not going to come wherever you are and you'll be the one to make me angry. No, I'm the only person who has been given permission to make myself angry. So whatever anybody says is their personal business. And I say it everywhere, and I'll repeat it here again, that insults and, pra and praises are the same thing to me. They are people's opinion about me. They are not my reality. And so when somebody comes and says, Aisha, you're a prostitute, fine and good. I have one customer. I do exclusive service. And any day that I want to add more of the customers, by the way, I will let you know and hope you can afford it. It's as simple as ABCD. It's their man. So as far as they are concerned, I'm a prostitute. But am I? Yes, yeah, I am to one guy. I do one customer. So I'm not going to get angry because somebody says that. But there are people that for that is going to affect them. And sometimes maybe for the whole day or something, they are walked up because somebody has said either they are, they are idiots or they're prostitutes or they're one thing or the other. It's their opinion. It's not my reality. It's their business. Let them say what they want to say. I know what I, who I am. I know what I want to be. I know what I'm doing. And that is all uh, that matters. So it's very important. Our mindset is very important. And then somebody will come and say, oh, Aisha, you're such an amazing human being. Is their opinion. Even if somebody says you are, you are an amazing human being, if you don't feel it in yourself, if you don't accept the fact that you are an amazing human being, it's still going to be a problem. You're not going to feel it. So it's what they say. So it's people's, whatever people say about you is their opinion and don't ever allow their opinion to become your, uh, your reality. I'm going to go to another thing, which is label. Label, uh, a lot of times, you know, we grew up wanting so much, some of these labels, especially the good label. You know, when they say to a child, oh, you're such a good child. You know, there's this happiness that comes from it. People grow up, grow up waiting, looking for that validation. They want to be known as good women. They want to be known as, the, I said to myself, I don't want to be known as, as a good woman. No, 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 no. I don't want to be known as a good person. Good people die young, so keep it there. I'm going to be me. Whatever it is that you think that is, it's your personal business. And as long as that is a kind of freedom that you get. Early on, as a young, as a young girl, I realized that these labels were used to cage people. They, they, they were used to cage people and keep people, uh, children and uh, oh, you are the good one. So people get to treat you anyhow that they want to, because of course they know that you are the good one. They hold you to their own standard and they begin to enforce their expectations on you. So because you're the good one, they can come and treat you anyhow, treat you in a bad manner and get away with it. And even when you want to raise your voice, you hear people, oh, but you're supposed to be the good one. But why are you doing this now? No, nah, I don't want to do the good one, be the good one. And I see somebody, uh, you know, in, two, in 2016, when uh, Michelle Obama did uh, that statement and said, if they go low, we go lower. I said, nah, that's a wrong way. If they go low, go lower. No, uh, Michelle Obama said, if they go low, we go higher. I said, nah, that's a wrong way. If they go low, go lower. Deal with them, then come up, shower, and then go high. So that in that way, they know that it's a choice not to stay down. That if they want to get that, you will make the whole place muddy. And I see some people, oh, no, you know, don't, don't, don't wrestle with the pigs or the wives. Nah, wrestle with them. When they know that is where you are, they will stay off you. For me, I say, I don't know how to put it. There is a set freedom to just be who you want to be and not the label they have caged you into, not the expectation that they have of you that they want you to live to. And I always say to people, I'm not responsible for your expectations. That's your personal business. I'm responsible for me and that's it. I'm going to be me and leave me. Whatever expectations are you have of me, that's it. Some people will come and say to me, oh, Aisha, I, I, I thought uh, you were supposed to be a mother. You're supposed to not say anything. Oh, you're supposed to be, I say, well, that's your expectation of me. It's not my reality. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. That at the end of the day, I'm leaving that place. A, a happy person, a contented person. I'm not holding anybody uh, in, in my mind. So ensure that labels, oh, you, oh, she's such a good wife. I made up my mind even before I got married that I was never going to be one that they were going to call a good wife. Guess what? Growing up as a child, I looked at the women around me and the women that they called good wives were the women whose husbands were either molesting them, abusing them, uh, were never giving them money, uh, financially being abused. They were working so hard. 
had, or the men had nothing. And those were the women that were called good women. Oh, she's such a good woman. I find her in-laws are saying good women. And then the women that were bad women are the women that, you know, they, they, they had a good life. Either they had an amazing relationship with their husbands or they had a good life or they had there was wealth in the family. And then you say, oh, she's such a bad wife. She's the reason why uh, the husband is not giving us anything. Our brother is not giving us anything. And for me, I chose to be a bad wife rather than the good wife that they wanted. Because by the time they are calling you good wife, be sure that even they will not will not stay uh, with whoever it is, uh, whether it's their, their their brother or their cousin or their relative. Or and so I didn't want that labor. Labor it's what they use to they use it to enforce their expectation on you, make you to conform to certain things. And then the moment you want to break out of it, you already put in a particular task. They oh oh this one is a good one. People learn to stay off my lane. Oh yeah, Aisha is crazy. I'm crazy. And I always say, my mom always laughs at it. And I say to people, every one of us has a bed in the psychiatric hospital. It depends on who is it that wants to occupy it. We are crazy people. Come on. I don't want to conform to those uh, reality that you want me to conform to that will make me, that will make you not feel that, oh, she's such a good person. And, uh, and you know one thing, uh, uh, BC, I see you there. You, at the end of the day, guess who are the ones that have fun, the ones that they call crazy women, the ones they call stubborn women, the ones they call all of that? Because you get to live your life. It's very important. Remember, there is only one you in this world. So that means you are an endangered uh, uh, species. I'm going to talk about support. Do you support yourself? Are you your own champion? It's very important. It's very important that you, first of all, you support yourself. You believe in yourself. You allow yourself to go. Like Jim Rohn said, if you want to set a, uh, a goal, you should set a big enough goal so that in the process of achieving that goal, you become somebody what's becoming. It's very important for you to be able to support yourself, to love yourself enough, and give your, uh, yourself permission to excel. You're not going to have those glass ceilings if you're waiting for other people to be the ones to tell, to give you, to give you validation, to validate your, your desire to get that, uh, to get whatever it is you want to achieve. And I see a, a lot of people, you know, what do they do? They are waiting for other people to support their dreams. They are waiting for other people to give them permission. No, you first of all have to give yourself permission. You first of all have to uh, support yourself. You first of all have to allow yourself to know that yes, you can actually uh, get it's not going to be easy. Sometimes we are fighting little voices that were planted in our heads when we were small. And uh, let me give you a bit of story. I had a, a, fr a friend, a friend of ours. You know, her husband had lost his job and everything. Was trying to get a job and all of that. She too wasn't working. And every time, every of her prayers and everything was for her husband. And then there was this our mother, our friend, our friend's mother, who one day, you know, when she was talking, oh, "Mama, please pray for my husband." And then the mother, the mother said to her, "When are you going to pray for yourself? When are you going to think about you?" Don't you know you, you two are deserving of holding that? Because we're brought up as little girls that, you know, this uh, knight in a shiny armor kind of mentality, there will be a man that will take care of you. No, you're the one to take care of yourself. Every other thing is Jara. You're the one to be in charge of your finances. You're the one to be in charge of your life. You're the one to be in charge of what you do. And so please don't self-sabotage yourself. You find out that uh, 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 there are quite a number. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this specifically uh, to, to, to women in this. We find out that most of us, we are earning money. We've gone to school. We're earning as, you know, any as much as our male counterpart, but because of the little voices in our head, we are not growing it into wealth. So what happens? We're self-sabotaging. We're getting to a place. So you rather waste it on things that, oh, you're buying the latest bag, you're buying a shwebi, you're buying these amazing hairs, you're doing all of that, but you're not really investing. You're not really investing. And guess what? That was what our mothers did. Our mothers were earning money. They were, they were traders. They were entrepreneurs. They were doing little businesses. They had their shop, but they were never investing. They were using the money. What were they doing? They were doing competition of buying rappers. They were buying these Georgies, Hollandis, and all of that. And then at the end of the day, what happened? While our fathers were giving our, uh, our brothers lands, our mothers were giving us rappers. Who wants rappers? I don't want rappers. I want land. So let's not make the mistake that our parents made. Let's not just waste it on buying the latest 
designer bags and all of that, let's also invest. Let's buy properties. Let's buy houses. Let's buy land so that when our our, 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 when our male counterparts are giving their sons houses and lands and everything, we equally have houses and lands and all of that to give to our sons. I built my first house in the year two, 2007, and I'm going to give you a bit of story uh, around that. Uh, so around 2006, my friend was looking for accommodation. She was looking for a house, and then we went house hunting. While we were doing house hunting, that was in Kaduna in the northern part of Nigeria. I, I came, we came to a particular place where they had this two two bedroom unit in uh, in a compound. And then, of course, for me, the idea was so fantastic, and I was like, "Oh wow, amazing! These are two two bedroom flats, and then they were rented. I was like, this is something you can get your passive income there." Uh, I, I started reading about financial literacy, uh, uh, learning financial literacy early on, and you know, working on that, especially the richest man in Babylon, and 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 and, and all of that. And so when I saw that, I was I was really I really loved it, and I came to my husband and I said to my husband, "Oh, this is what I." I've seen. It's such a good idea. Can you start, you, you could build, start building? And my husband wasn't interested. And he said, oh, and then you now put in tenants and you, you have to be going after. To For almost a year, I was on my husband's case to build those, uh, uh, to build. He wasn't interested commercially. And then one day I said to myself, if it's not going to build, what stops you from building? You see what just happened at that moment? I gave myself permission. I gave myself permission to excel. I gave myself permission to own it. This was me. This was, it wasn't somebody coming to tell me. I said, and I went to meet my husband. I said, sweetheart, baby, I'm going to build, I'm going to build that house. And I have an amazingly supportive, supportive husband. And immediately I said, he said, okay. And he started looking for land. And I bought my land. By the end of the year, towards this thing, I had finished, I had finished building. Two two bedroom flat, and that uh, that's over how many years now? About th thirteen years now. Uh, the initial capital in building the house, I've end, I've used, I've collected that in terms of rent and everything. But you see, because of the little voice in my head, where I was brought up to believe that there are men that we give, uh, there are men that we, uh, that we take care of us, and not us taking care of ourselves. I had that mentality. I was waiting for my husband to build. And over a year, I kept asking him. When I was running my business, I had my business. I had my, um, my money. I could do this. But the little voices in my head wasn't uh, putting me towards that. And of course, I, I started. And by the time I started, uh, people were, were coming in. Guess what? My husband too started building his own. And that was it. I gave myself permission. And so I brought up my daughter never, ever, ever to think that there's somebody who is going to uh, take care of her financially. No, she, she's responsible for herself and taking care of herself. And that's the reason why the same education we're giving to your brother is the same education we're giving to you. Nobody is being, there's no distinction. And so grow up to know that you be the one to take care of yourself. And so that's giving yourself permission to excel and not self-sabotage yourself. Uh, so there's this thing also that comes from intimidation. I'm going to talk about uh, AI, this intimidation. It happens a lot. And most times when you see people, especially in an abusive relationship, or women are more or less in an abusive relationship in the world. Yeah, because we're brought up to, oh, let your voice should never be heard. You should only be seen and heard. Hey, you're sort of like, is a sub uh, a subhuman being, especially in this part of the world. Why your brothers were outside playing, uh, forming allegiances, forming uh, uh, alliances, and all of that. You were inside the house cleaning. You were inside the house cooking. You were inside. You were all kept in separate, separate uh, places. And then you grew up. You got married. You automatically change your name. You to even find yourself to find somebody a female you were in secondary school with. It's quite difficult, right? So there's so much of this abusive relationship. And then you're told, oh, because you're a woman, you can't do this. Because you're a woman, you can't do. This. So there's that intimidation. So we're already. So whether in your own house. You, you are in an abusive relationship or not. We as women, we are in an abusive relationship with the world already. And you know, somebody put it this way the other time. She said, as women, we have post-traumatic -trauma uh, stress disorder. And the moment she said it, I said, yes. Because you're going around and the first thing, you're, you're clenched. If you're walking down a low, lonely road, your body is clenched. You're waiting for, for that attack. If you're going somewhere, you, you, you're so self-conscious. That's abusive in a way. And so what do we do? 
a lot of women face intimidation and instead of them to own their spaces and let their voices be heard, they, 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 they drift in, they shift in. They think that the more they say nothing, the more they don't do anything, the more they are the good girls, the good wives, the good women, and tolerate all sorts of nonsense being thrown at them, the more that they're going to escape and they will be spared. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> Remember what I said, if you want peace, be prepared for war. You need to stand your ground. They need to look at you and say, ah, this woman, she's crazy. Ah, we don't want our hala. You know, for me, that's a lot. Even as a child, that was the, that was the, for me, that was the most beautiful thing. I mean, nobody wanted Aisha's wahala. And I had a sister, my immediate junior sister, who was this very quiet person, you know, the normal girl that is expected, very accommodating, anything they do to her, she never says anything. But guess what? She is the one that people are always putting the things on. Whatever crap they had, they dumped it on her face because they know at the end of the day, she's not going to say anything anyway. She's going to accept it. But when it comes to Aisha, they say, ah, no, 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 no. Leave that one. Ah, no, no, that one, she's crazy. Leave that. So you got your freedom for just owning your voice owning your space and just uh, being there. So the more you're keeping quiet, the more you're not speaking, the more you're not asserting yourself, you're not gonna be spared. And I see a lot of, you find a lot of women, oh, I'm afraid, uh, oh, maybe my husband will leave you. If he's going to leave you, if you never had, if, if you're afraid that he's going to leave him, then sorry, you never had him in the first place. <laughs> you want to leave, oh, that's it, oh, there. why? Because I'm in love with myself. I have enough love for myself. I am crazy. <laughs> you want to leave, what? It is you when you know you want to leave that, ah, this is, you are missing, you're gonna miss a whole package. The guy will stay back. But when you're like, when you take all kind of things, oh, they're throwing this at you. Ah, my ill, ah, no, my illness, we say, how? If you, I'm the kind of person, I don't even know whether you are in law or you are my sibling, you are all the same. If you do anyhow, you see anyhow, I don't send you. So the first thing you're gonna know, stay there. So there's this thing about, you know, people in a busy relationship, you know, just trying to say, oh, let, let, me, let me form good girl. Let me form good wife. Let me form good this one. And the more you are forming the good, the good, the more they are stamping on your head as if they too, they are afraid that they, they are going to come. Honestly, because, you know, I always say to people, it is no longer our parents' era or even the ones before them where you needed a man to be able to feed yourself, you needed a man to be able to, to, to protect you, to clothe you, to, oh no, no. I need a man for happiness, for companionship. If you're not gonna make my life better, if you're not gonna make me happier, please, can you see that door and move on? And a lot of people are being afraid of being shamed, of being divorced, I'm like, for every divorced woman, there's a divorced man. Hello, did I, did I say something to anybody? For every divorced woman, there's a divorced man. So you cannot shame me with divorce. I have an amazing human being I, I, that I'm married to. I'm in a great relationship. I respect my husband like no man's business. Guess what? Because he respects me back. He respects me. I mean, respect begets respect. Recently, I had a, a moment to share. There was a message. We were supposed to have traveled uh, in April for our 22nd wedding anniversary. And unfortunately, uh, because of the COVID-19, we couldn't go. So around March, towards that, my husband sent me a mail, uh, a, a message. Then I, I was still in, uh, in UK, in Scotland, while my husband was back in Nigeria. I, I had gone to spend one year with my daughter to settle her in school. And so my husband sent me a message. And so when he said that, so I had to send it to, to the agency that we were, uh, I was working with, I had planned our way down like, oh, this is what my husband was saying about, you know, talking about the COVID-19 and the father. And she, you know, you know if the feedback I got from her, for me, it was something I take for granted because that was the norm. She was like, oh, the, re the way my husband asked, he was asking me to look into that, the respectful tone in which my husband sent me that message, not as if, oh, I'm the Lord and whatever, giving you this thing. And I'm like, oh, okay. Because for me, that's what I'm used to. You know, I, I'm, you're not gonna, you, you're not gonna come and sit on my head. No, because you know what? I love me, I am fulfilled. I, I am in love with myself. Uh, I give myself happiness. So anything you are bringing is Jara. When my husband uh, wanted to uh, uh, start uh, courting me, when, when we met and he was toasting me, I remember the first day he said to me, maybe I'll be coming to your school uh, to visit you, to your hostel and visit you on Saturday. And I said to him, I don't do maybes. I don't do maybes. It's either you're coming or you are not uh, coming. And so because that's it. 
I'm not going to sit there in my room all day waiting for you to come and meet me. Then I will not go and do what I'm going to do. No. And I see a lot of people. There are some people who are living in this very awful relation, either marriages or relationship or what is it? They are afraid because I'm afraid people will say, no, Umbo, no, I am going to live my life where I'm happy. I've been married for 22 years. By uh, April 17th, it will be 23 years of amazing marriage. And I say to people, I don't believe that that's the end of the kind of amazing marriage I can get. If it doesn't work out, if, for example, we fall out of love, or if it doesn't work out, like, okay, guy, it's been a good run. We have an amazing time, time to move on. And yes, that's it. And we have fun. And I have the kind of, you know, own yourself, own your voice. I'm married to the kind of man that, we say things to each other. We are free about saying things to each other. And recently, you know, we were talking about the father. Oh, he is old. He can get a younger, a younger. I'm like, oh, I can get a young man too. Hello. I saw on Twitter the other day. Uh, you know, somebody was saying that uh, uh, that uh, uh, oh, his mother. Uh, if it's new, they were talking about women and they were like, even sons to tell you how women are so caged that their mothers would dare, if their fathers should die or something, their mothers would dare not uh, think of remarrying. And I said to them, you're very lucky I'm not your mother because I will not only remarry, I will marry somebody that is probably younger than you. Because if you are above 25 years of age, what do I need you for? I have married an old man before. Hey, if I have to marry again, what am I doing with an old man? It's as simple as that. But that's the kind of systemic caging that women have had to endure. And you find out that you think uh, it, it's normal. So those are uh, intimidation. Please don't, don't allow that. And most importantly, also, don't also play the woman card. It's very easy to say, oh, this thing did not happen to me, or it happened to me because I'm a woman. And then you just go and sit down and do nothing about it. No, there's nothing like, that's why I say, don't, don't, don't allow yourself those labels. I, for one, I don't care. I'm not, I don't see myself as a woman or a man. Or what, I just see myself as me. Whatever you want to call me, call me that. That's your own business. I know I'm this human being that was created to be on earth. And if at any space I find, I'm going to have fun in the space. And yes, of course, you know, most times women are the ones that are being shamed out of divorce or something. No. And I see people sometimes, you know, initially people used to insult me. I say, oh, you are a divorcee. I say, how is a divorcee an insult? And it meant that, yeah, we've had a good time and now we are moving on. Everybody has been having his whole life. How is it an insult? And for every, and I will repeat this again. For every divorced woman, there is a divorced man. Simple. So divorce is divorce. Now, yeah, we moved on and, and, and that's it. And, and it must be. So like I said, don't play the woman card. Don't always look at this and say, oh, it's because of I'm a woman. That pity parties, drop it. Drop it. Drop it. Nobody is interested. Drop it. Tell yourself to stop it. Go out there. Nobody cares whether you are a woman or you are a man. Own yourself. Don't look. Don't limit yourself to a gender. Don't limit. After all, people change gender these days anyhow. So why are you limiting yourself to one thing? Don't limit yourself to a gender or a label. Own you. Own yourself. No matter it is, own it and hold your head high up and do what you want to do. Uh, before I, I, I will still be rounding up. I know you're supposed to. I'm supposed to have like thirty minutes. Uh, I'll just do this uh, and go on. The next thing, of course, is wealth is a woman, because I would love to have a lot of questions coming in. And please, when it's time for those uh, questions, feel free to ask anything. For me, no, nothing is, is off uh, discussion. If I submit the answer, I will tell you I know, if I, I, if, if I don't know the answer. Yeah, exactly. Nobody is interested uh, in sub stories. And there are people, we go, there are people who have this, who have this, who love it when when all, it seems all the mis things miserable things in their lives happen to them? They will come to you all in their relationship. Uh, they, they are, their husbands are doing this or they are or they are whatever or this or that. They will give you all of these sub stories, and then you are like, these are the things you need to do. They don't do it. You know what I've I've gotten myself into? I used to tolerate that early most on, and I would carry the burden on my head. A hard friend. There are some friendship. If it's not working, cut it. It's okay. People outgrow each other. Move on with your lives. and just girl. And they bring this soft story. Oh, it's as if every bad thing always happens to them. But when it's time for them to take action, they never do because they refuse to take responsibility for what is happening. They will blame everybody but, but themselves. They will. Bl they need to get to a place where they are taking. If you are not taking it, in, please, please, please don't unburden on me. 
I've learned there are people who will never take what they think they need to do. They just love to come and or burden on people. They love pity parties. They love sob stories. They love being in the center of attention and saying that all the bad things you can think, think about uh, happens to them. Nah, stop it. Stop it. There's only one you and therefore those who exactly they drain your energy i tell you you never focus on doing your own thing they always drag you know stop it cut it off if you have to stop the friendship stop it and move on uh with your life and i see a lot of people who say oh i'm staying in this relationship because of my children the worst thing you can do for your children is to stay in an abusive relationship. The worst thing you can do to your children is to stay in a place where you're not being respected because your children are looking at you and learning from you that they too are not deserving of respect. Let me give you an example. I recently, uh, I spent one year in the UK and, uh, and uh, I, I, I was with my daughter, just getting my daughter settled in school. And then, of course, my husband missed me a lot. And I was like, okay, when I come back, and I'm, I'm in this place where I'm taking care of myself, what I eat, and I'm very deliberate. So I'm cooking my own meals and everything. And my daughter said to me, you know, mommy, I don't like this domesticated you. I don't like it, you know, and I'm like, when I call back, I'm like, oh, I'm the one cooking in the kitchen. Other, words, other times I have other people who are cooking or the cook and all of that. And she's like, uh, she's like, oh, no, mommy, I don't like this domesticated you. I want the diva. So stay in an abusive relationship and say that it's because of your children. No, you are actually killing that. You are actually abusing your children a lot because your children need to see you. You are that strength. They need to see you standing up owning yourself, loving yourself, being yourself. And you know what? When you love yourself, every other person is forced to love you, whether they like it or not. Instead of you to go and buy a cake outside, you are baking it because you want to be the number one, to be known as good wife. No, I don't want to be a good wife. I want, I, do you know one thing? I, mean, for, I When I got married to my husband, I said to him, I'm not going to be your wife. I'm going to be side chick. I'm the side chick with legality. Let others, I'm not going to do wife business. And he always says I act more like a girlfriend uh, than a, and a wife. I, I, I prefer it uh, in that manner. And so my mom was, so I was telling her, as soon as we were talking, my, my husband came in and she said, and I said to my husband, oh, your mother-in-law is here being worried about you. So come and listen to your mother-in-law. And my mom, honestly, you know, this is how, this is how our, our mothers, and there's some of us also, and stretch this patriarchy. And she says to my, my husband, ah, I'm very, very sorry. She started by apologizing. So my husband was sort of like shocked. And he looked at her and said, what's, what's wrong? She says, since I came, I've noticed that your wife is not entering the kitchen. She's not cooking for you. And my husband said, why should she cook for me? And my mom was like a bit taken aback. She was like, and she looked at me. She was like, ah. he said, no, but there are people who are cooking. And moreover, she had been the one to cook the, because I normally will cook a uh, stock of the, the soups and, and all of that. So as soon as my husband left, my mom said something to me. She said, you know, it's your husband that is spoiling you. I'm like, really? I said, she said, you know, in our custom, a woman is supposed to cook a culture. And I said to my mom, who are the people that set these rules? Who are the people? And my mom said, oh, the people are long dead. And I said to her, then do you know what? I'm going to set new rules, new culture that the generation that are coming are going to live by. So at the end of the day, what I'm just saying is that give yourself permission to do what you want to do. And for me, in my relationship, I say this, or I'm going to say it here today, is that we don't have gender-based rules. What we have are strength-based roles, not gender-based roles. So I'll do something that is <clears throat> my trend to do. My husband does the things within his strength to do. And we are crazy. And that's how we've always owned our craziness. Even when we were getting married, you know the way <laughs> somebody says laughing out loud, the way that, you know, when they will carry my, uh, the wedding things and then you go, the family will bring it. It was myself and my husband that did that. We made sure right from day one, this is how we're going to live our lives. And this is it. Every other person, sorry, you just have to go align with what we want. We are not the ones aligning with what the other people. So give yourself permission to be as crazy as you can be. Craziness is allowed. Hello, Aaron. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> oh, my God. I've been struggling to find a way to come in because I've just been laughing behind. In fact, my throat got stuck at some point. Um, well done, well done, well done, um, Aisha. There's, I'm sure we have, <clears throat> we have so many questions um getting ready getting ready to come 
All right, so I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Once again, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're ready? <laughs> yeah, so, with my friendship. Question for you, actually. At what point did, at what point in your upbringing did the knots get loosed in your brain? All my life. You know what I normally <laughs> say? I was born with drugs. You know how people need to get drugs to be high? I was actually born high in my life, and that's the way I've always been. And uh, if I'll just say, you know, a lot of the things that people do in their, maybe or never do in their lives, mm. are during their life, I did it as a child. So mm. as a teenager, I was thinking about life. Who am I? The question <clears throat> who am I? I discovered who I, who I was before I was like 13. I, I was reading motivational books. I was reading books on psychology. In short, I read so much. Uh, I always, uh, uh, to be an, is it atheist? Yes, atheist, right? Because I'm always missing that pronunciation. My kids are always making fun of me. So I started reading books on whether God ever existed when I was like less than 14 years. And I remember my, my father would be like, oh, you need to pray. You know, you need to do this so that when you when you die, you're going to go to heavens and heavens. Every, and I'm like, and I, I, want, I want that to my dad. Heavens must be very boring if everything is going to be given to you. And I was reading these books where they were saying, oh, when you believe in God, it means it's like chasing a black cat in a black room and all of that. So these are things that people do as adults. I did them as a young girl. So I was able to call, arrive at a place. That's why I do what I want to do. For example, hijab. I wear my hijab. I started wearing hijab in 1992. I think I was 17, 18 then when I started wearing And I don't, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't care for people's validation, if I may put it that way. So I, I own myself. I'm like, this is what I need to do. And that's it. So I did a lot of things that many people probably never get to do in their lives at a very young age. So yeah. I knew who I was. And, and, and so that was just it. Nice. Let's take the question there because I, I know a lot of people want to ask questions, so I don't want to miss out on their questions. So someone is asking, so how does one reset, re-engineer, I guess, re-engineer from the norm and just have, because guys, I mean, we can celebrate. What I see Aisha represent this evening is freedom. It takes a certain level of freedom to be able to speak like this and just be free with yourself. And I think someone is listening and asking how does one reset how can one come away from the norm and experience this true freedom so how does one do that is first of all to sit down <clears throat> look in the mirror find a place and ask yourself who am i you need to know who you are you need to know what your strengths are what your weaknesses are you need to first of all accept yourself so on that discovery, and I say, when I talk to people and we're working on this, sometimes I have some of my mentees, I say it can be the most painful experience that you go through. Just yeah. first of all, learning who you are and accepting. You know, a lot of us, we put, there's something we put out to the world. There's what you want the world to see. And most people, what their, their outside is different from <clears throat> their inside. So mm. that's why you find a lot of conflict where people are not finding a place where they are happy with themselves. So yeah. you need to get to the place where, first of all, you first of all go inward and ask yourself who you are. Allow yourself to, to, to embrace the real you and then allow the world to see the real you. And from there, you just set. You begin to set to say, no, it's not about what people say. It's about who you are. It's about what you want. And stop hiding from the world. Many people are hiding from the world. And that's the reason why you find out that they are, they are bottled up, they are angry, they are not finding their true happiness because they have not allowed themselves to fly. I say to people, what you see on the outside, my outside matches my inside. If I'm no. angry, I'm going to be angry. <clears throat> Aaron, you can make me angry right now. I'm going to go off the hook. This me when I see that they speak grammar, na 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 na, I will change things. I will play for so na 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 na. Yes, if I don't play three minutes, I will be done. Because what, at that moment, you're not saying something and I'm holding it in. I'm trying to, oh, I want to be Aisha that is seen as a, you know, be composed. But no, 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 I can't be composed. If you go crazy, you go crazy. No, 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 when you take your soup. So you need to get to a place where you are in acceptance with yourself so that the what you are, you can allow the word see in and out. And it comes from, first of all, you understanding yourself, accepting yourself, then allowing the word to be, uh, to see who you are and just take it off from there. Then we yeah. talk, oh. The thing is that, uh, Aaron, before I, I just ran up on this, Go the on. people we talk, but yep. the thing that whatever you do, people will always talk. So it is better you 
you are you, you get yourself where you are happy with yourself why they are talking rather than you still be unhappy with yourself and they are still talking so I, I actually like the question on screen and i would i'll paraphrase before i get to that question because um i'm a christian i'm a man of faith you're a person of faith um somebody somebody saw my i was on zoom today and somebody saw the flyer for the first time and the person said is that a muslim is that a muslim i said yes what is she coming to your show i said yes she's coming to my show and then but now i'm just saying this question and this is a very good question even though i know the answer the person says to the question but i still have to ask can I say the question? Can, I still have to ask. Um, where have you been before now? Because as a Muslim woman, you're, I'm surprised at how brave and courageous you are and how you are able to express yourself so beautifully. I'm telling you, so uh, anyway, but go as a, as, a, as a Muslim woman, one of the things I've been able to do well is knowledge. And I think I forgot to mention that uh, 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 knowledge is important. As mm. much as possible, get that it's very read books. It's not to be mm. gisting about uh, what kind of rapper are you going to sew, what kind of uh, cloth. I think I missed that in, in the in the and the this talk I gave. It's very important to have knowledge. Knowledge they say is power. It's powerful. So that helps you when they come with some of the things they try to do because the patriarchy we have in the society based sometimes doesn't even come from religion. It comes from people just using their custom to ensure that voices are kept down. And I, when I say to a lot of people that as a Muslim woman, I can decide to breastfeed my kids or not, and people are always surprised. I say, yes, Islam gives me the right to say that, okay, I don't want my boobs to sag. Excuse my language. I don't want my breast to sag. So because of that, I'm not gonna breastfeed my children. Uh, we, we go and get uh, a, a, a wet nose. It's allowed, but many people don't do that. So if we don't get the knowledge, you will not know the things that are allowed in Islam or are not allowed in Islam, whatever religion it is. So knowledge is very important. And for me, that was one of the things I used a lot. Even as a little girl, when my parents would be like, oh, this, this, that, I was always quick to quote out, okay, this knowledge, this from this, this from that. And, and it helped uh, a, a lot. So I know that I have my voices because as women in Islam, we are allowed our voices. Even during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a lot of women, when they had issues they were uncomfortable about or they didn't like, they always had, uh, they came together and they, and they went to accost the, pro, uh, the prophet and they sent a representative to say, these are the things being done to women and they felt which weren't right. And so it, it, it's allowed in Islam, it, it's part of the things uh, that uh, you, but you find out that people's culture and custom, they use that to overshadow uh, the religion and make it seem as if well, women are not supposed to say anything. Good stuff. Now, so considering your background, and I'm, I mean, especially in the country you grew up, do you think women surrounding you as a young girl had platforms to speak? Even though I don't think you had platforms to speak, you literally created your own platform. And so how did, that you? how did people try to suppress you? Because for someone like me growing up, I was told I was a talkative. So let alone you yeah. being a woman, right? So how did you Absolutely. bring up all that norm where society, family, everybody would have tried mm -hmm. to suppress your voice growing up. How did that impact you? And how did that, how did, what happened to you that you were still able to stay you, true to you and not the confirmation and still be a oh. voice today? So, so what, part of the things that I did was I never asked, asked for permission from anybody. And even as a child, I was never one that wanted that sought for anybody's validation. So I was not interested in those words of being called, oh, you are a good child. So I, I was never the child that was called a good child. Oh, this guy, she's too stubborn. That was what I had. Oh, you behave like a man. You, you know, you are a lady. You're supposed you are a woman. Why are you behaving like a man and all of that? I heard that uh, uh, a lot. Uh, but I was one who gave myself permission to speak, and I spoke irrespective. <clears throat> and honestly, I didn't care whether anybody, I know it might sound bad now, sometimes I look back like, oh my goodness, how did my parents even cope with me? Because I was quite a handful. And I didn't mind, I was beaten a lot. It got me into a lot of trouble and I was flogged a lot. But guess what? When you're flogging me, I'm not gonna move an inch. I'm not gonna move a muzzle. I'm gonna stand ramrod straight. When you finish flogging me, I'll just move away. So that was the kind of uh, a, a, a child that, that I was. So because I never sought validation, so. If, for example, something, let me give you a, a, an illustration of this. There was a moment that my father, uh, my father accused me of something. I can't even remember what it is right now. And I, I, thought, I didn't do it. And I said to my dad, I didn't do it. But he didn't believe me. Well, I left it at that. 
At the end of the day, they found out it was one of my cousins who had done it. And so why would it was, we we're all gathered as a family. My, uh, my aunts were there, my mom, my dad, and all of that. And I said to my dad, you wronged me and you need to apologize to me. Wow. And then apparently that was, uh, that was like, I was maybe, I was less than 15 when this happened. And that was like an abomination in my, in my, in my culture that if a child wouldn't, shouldn't say that the father had wronged her. And so my father was quite angry with me and he stopped talking to me. And well, for me, as far as I'm concerned, I didn't do anything wrong. And in the morning, I would go to my father. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you will all go and kneel down and greet your parents. So I would kneel down and I would greet my father. And my father wouldn't answer. I wasn't bothered. Because as far as I'm concerned, I did what I was supposed to do, which is what is in my control, which is to greet you. You replying my greetings is not in my control. It's in your control. And you know whether you want to do it. So if I do, uh, daddy, meaning daddy, good morning. As I finish, I don't stand up, work out my own day too. So that was the kind of fact. Honestly, and even up to today, I do things that are in my control. I do them. Things that are in other people's control, I, I don't even uh, bother about that. But let me tell you something. One of the things that I, I took strength from the from the women around me who mm -hmm. were being oppressed like and suppressed. And so the more I saw them being oppressed, the more I said to myself, never was I going to be that person who was being oppressed. Never was I going to be that. Because I saw some of this, uh, uh, the women around me, you know, the men weren't doing anything. They were the ones who were going to market, looking for everything, and then they would bring food. Sometimes the man would be angry and refuse to eat the food. And then the woman is asked to go and beg him. That thing used to hit me. I'm like, first of all, you were supposed to provide food. You didn't provide food. I had to, while you're staying at home, I had to go and look for food for you. And then now you're refusing to eat it. And I'm being told to beg you. No, 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 no. Honestly, to be very honest with you, even uh, uh, my parents thought I, I wouldn't uh, I, I wouldn't stay in a man's house because of the kind of mind I have. And I and I say to people a lot that if not for the kind of husband that a man, a man who I say he, he is, uh, uh, how do I put it now? He's secured in his right. manhood. A secure man, secure in his manhood and doesn't feel that he's in a competition uh, with his wife and they has to prove anything. If not for the kind of person I, I got married to, I, I probably wouldn't be uh, married up to now because some of the things I see people do, I'm like, no, how do you tolerate that? And Or maybe if I didn't get married early enough, I probably uh, wouldn't have gotten married. Because even my parents used to say, they wonder whether I was, I was ever going to stay in a man's house because of the kind of, uh, some of the things I just couldn't really tolerate them. Interesting. Two things. Let's celebrate your husband. We celebrate a confident, secure man. It takes a mm -hmm. confident, secure man to allow their wife yeah. be secure and confident. So we celebrate your husband. And secondly, I was actually going to talk about sometimes when you see, when you hear your story, you begin to, I was going to ask if you had strong women around you, but in your case, it was actually the reverse. It was the fact that yeah, it was the reverse. Yeah. Oh. were oppressed. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, yes. So my that, own case, yeah, yeah. I had oppressed women, and I always said to myself, I would not, I would not allow myself be that person. I would not. So my, I came from, so I came from the from the point of defense. Mm. I was never ever going to allow myself be in the position that the women around me, from my mom and my aunties and some of our friends, the kind of position they were in, I never wanted to be in that position. So I was quite defensive. And there was a bit of aggression. So mm. for me, like uh, growing up, I never, I never collected any money from any man. Maybe I owe you any gift. I was not interested because I didn't want anybody. <clears throat> I grew up very poor, and I didn't want anybody coming to insult me or because of they think oh they're giving you something or mm. so. I never wanted that. And I think uh, somehow because you know we are product of our upbringing and and then the things that we have gone through. So there yeah. was a bit of anger and a bit of aggression in me in the in terms of no 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 i'm gonna i'm not gonna tolerate this and mm. then one other thing i think that i did share about myself is that i'm, I'm a control freak in okay. a way and i never went out with any man that i was not the one who instigated the relationship wow. so i was i was not one of those that a man will come and meet you oh we'll come and toast you no 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 i needed to want you first you know all, all of that even even my my my, my husband I know I, I so I wasn't one to sit back and just wait for somebody to come and meet to all of those that did I, I wasn't interested.
So I had to be the one who was doing the hunting. So that's to tell you the kind of person I was. And so when I got married to my husband, you know, coming from that point of view of even when we started a relationship of that a bit of aggression, mm. a bit of um, no, 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 I'm not going to allow what happened to my mom. I'm not going to allow what happened to my aunties. I'm not going to allow what happened to the women around me. It happened to me. There was a bit of that. So it mm. took a man who was very, who is very secure in his smile and very, to be able to bring that down. And I always say to people, wow. my husband taught me how to say, I'm sorry. And I taught my husband how to say, I love you. So, because this is things, I grew up knowing that I wanted a man and a family where we would always say, I love you to each other. Because the first time anybody ever said, I love you to me, I was around 10 years old. And that almost got me into an abusive, uh, into, uh, this guy was an adult. And then the first time he said to me, oh, Aisha, Aisha is my girlfriend. I love her. And I'm like, oh. That was the first time anybody ever said I love you to mm. me. And then he sort of then he sort of like became my pseudo boyfriend. He would write wow. notes to me. I would keep them in my pocket. And then we my dad then my dad was doing his business and I would carry eggs and give to him and all of that and things. And one day my mom found the notes in my pocket and my school bag and she beat the living daylights out of me. The only thing that probably saved me from uh from a molestation in his hands was because. I never, you know, in the in the court, I never stayed with him. So anytime I would see him, I would run away, but he would always send notes through somebody. So for me, after that, I always said to myself, if I get married, I love you would always be part of our relationship okay. and even our children. Now, up till today, it's it's the way we say that to each other a hundred times a day. That's amazing. And I'm, I'm just hoping that even the men and the women who are listening are hearing that because just hearing that alone can save a lot of our children from abuse yeah. and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and just looking at the question on, on screen, do you have a program for educating and enlightening young women and ladies? And I want you, I mean, if you do, please share. And again, just, just if you could, just what you said is just really powerful. If you could actually give people some some ways of finding out these things. Many kids don't hear their parents tell them they love them. Don't hear family members say they love them. What could be something that could trigger in the mind of a child that we parents can also begin to empower our children, apart from using the words I love you, but give them the signs that they can be watchful and protect themselves from abuse. One of the things uh, one of the things that I do for me, because uh, growing up as a child, I, I hated commands. I hated to be told, don't do this. I always ask, why shouldn't I do it? And I was that kind of, even as an adult, that's why I'm, I'm very low abiding. Whatever it is, I'll follow it. Irritatingly follow it to the letter because I have oh. a big mouth. If anything happens, I will come and, you know, after the, so I was always one who would obey, but I needed to know why. And so as a parent, what I did with my, what I do with my children is to give them information so that they'll be able to make informed decisions. I see a lot of parents want to tell their children, do this, don't do that. No, beyond, explain to them what are the repercussions, explain to them what are the things. Right from two years old, kids <clears throat> understand things. I'm gonna explain to you, don't touch this thing because it's hurt. When you oh. touch it, it's going to burn you. When I'm done with that, the next time, I, I won't say anything, if I see you touching it, you will touch it and it will hurt you and you understand. So. Yeah. Informed decision, uh, inf information is very key. So speaking to your children and letting them know, and sex education should start very early on, as far as two years old. That's what they call age-appropriate sex education. Information, information, information. There's nothing. I have a 22-year-old. There's no topic we don't talk about. There's nothing we don't. When they were going into their teenagers, I went as I went around the world when I traveled all over the world trying to get books for them, and I. I check through different books before I go to get the books on teenage, uh, uh, teenage years. And what did we do? We, we read it together. I read it first of all. I gave it to him. The re we read it together. I remember I would go drop my son in, the, in school in the morning. We would read a, a part of it. I explain everything to him. So it's very important. Then there was something else that I did with my children. I think uh, when they were like uh, maybe like between the ages of seven, eight, wow. eight and six, sort of. And I said to them, screaming, you'll be shocked at the, num at the number of kids that cannot scream, especially mm. this our album, at their born children. So this what I did to them, when you are in an uncomfortable situation, when you are in a place where you're not comfortable, open your mouth and just start screaming. 
Wow. Because most molesters and abusers don't like noise. Just wow. open your mouth and just start screaming. And then, of course, adults are going to come around and look and say, what is happening? Beyond that, although even today it's for a topic of it, I think this is important. We need to be consistent in the messages that we give our, 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 our children. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. There was a time myself and my, a friend of mine, we were young parents, and she had this little girl that was about three years, and we're already talking to her, you know, don't go into so-so and so person's room, don't be there and on your own, don't enter. So when we finish this conversation with the child, everything, and then the mom says to the child, oh, go and bring so-and-so from me from that room. Mm. And I said, no. And I heard the child, and I looked at the mom, I said, what are you doing? You just told this child not to enter yeah. this room. And then you're sending her to the same room. You So where is the consistency in the message? Mm. How is she yep. supposed to know? The time that it is right to enter the room and the oh. time uh, that it's not right to enter the room. So consistency is very important. What you're say, telling. And then another thing, which is most important, and I think this is the most crucial one to do with the question you asked me, allow your children to have their safe space. Yep. Allow your children to own their safe space. If a child says they are not hugging anybody, whoever they are, then the child shouldn't hug that person. Nice. Let your child understand that when they don't feel comfortable in any situation, they have a right to resist. Wow. If I see a child, I don't hug them. I don't hug children. I first of all ask their permission. And if the child says no, I say fantastic. Sometimes you find a parent, no, 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 no. I said no. Don't tell your child to hug anybody. They have a right to say no. And wow. that is the space. So what we do as a lot of parents do is that they, they erode that safe space of children. You know, you have a place, even as adults, there are some people you don't feel comfortable with them, and yep. it's okay. So when the children, oh, go and hug uncle, go and hug auntie, there's something like uncle and auntie. It's not everybody that is uncle and auntie. Even right now, when some people I meet together, oh, I know, I said, no, I'm not auntie Aisha, I'm Aisha. They need wow. to know the difference between family and not family, and we should be very explicit. This person is Mr. This, that person is Mrs. This. It's not anti this or uncle this. You need to let your children know. So when a child is not feeling safe, they'll be able to know that, ah, even when my parents are here, I don't feel safe, they allow it. So even mm -hmm. when your child is not feeling safe, because you are always the one that pushes, oh, go and hug uncle, go and do this, go and do that. Guess what happens? They are not feeling safe, but they are allowing the person who is going either or that is not making them feel space, come closer to them because you have eroded their safe uh, space. You have wow. not allowed them to own their safe space where they can say to anybody, no, don't come near me, just stay up there. And it's very important. This is freedom. I mean, you just you just gave us a masterclass in parenting right there. That's that's freedom. Some of the things you said, I haven't heard them that way. So I, I, I'm guilty as charged. Um, wait, you have to greet every uncle and auntie. No, that stopped tonight. Nah, nah. Yeah, yeah so stop it, has, stop it. They don't yeah. have to. Someone's asking, how can we transform the customs and trans and traditions to the freedom to this freedom of self? Uh, the custom. How can we transform from the customs and traditions to this freedom of self? So who are the people that set this custom and tradition? You don't even know them. <laughs> set your own. It's as simple as that. Own your space. Because that was why I said to my mom, when she said it's the custom, and I said to my mom, who is the person that said this custom and said that it's women have to be the one to enter kitchen and do the cooking? And she was like, oh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's been there right from generation. The people are all dead. I said, okay, I'm going to set a new one so that the next generation will come and meet a new one. That they, they will not change it when they want to. So I think... Uh, you know, the, the, the most important thing, and, and it comes from here, you know, as little as little children, we, we wanted badly those labels to be called a good child. So because you wanted those labels, so when you did something, we pat your head, good child. You grew up as adults, you're still waiting for people to pat your head. So because of that, you're doing all sorts of things that oh. even though you don't want to do that because the society says that is the way it, it has to be, you know, you keep going it. You keep doing it. So like I said earlier, the first thing is actually to, to understand yourself. To uh, <laughs> Somebody said that I've read her journal. Fantastic. <laughs> and so the first thing is to own yourself, to, to, to love yourself, to want to be you and not what other people are saying. So when you do that, you'll be able to do your own thing. 
Let me give you an example. Like, like my daughter, my children have never knelt down for anybody. They've never knelt down for me. I didn't bring up my children to be kneeling down for me. But I was brought up to kneel down for others. And even in my own religion, it's 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 not allowed for you know somebody to be spotting either greeting somebody you greet eye to eye and and everything handshake or whatever it is or a hug, and so when I brought up my children, I didn't do any of those things. You know, one of the things that my children normally say they say, "Oh, mommy, you know, uh, you didn't bring us up the way other parents did with their uh, with, with with their children." And then I said, and, and then there was a time my daughter was saying to me. Oh, you know, mommy, sometimes they will say African parents are this, this, that, but that's not true. You didn't do that. I said, no, the reason why it's not true is because I was deliberate. I was deliberate in the way I brought both of you up together. So that's why you, you some of the things you hear people say, they say African mothers or Nigerian mothers, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't relate to you. So coming to what, what, what I wanted to talk about was the fact that my kids, there was a time my, my aunt asked my mom and my daughter to bring water for her. And my daughter brought the water and gave it to her, you know, standing. And my aunt was like, oh, why is she standing? She needs to uh, need. I said to my aunt, no, I didn't bring up my daughter that way. I said, you you're, you, brought us up to kneel down for you. I mean, in our, when you kneel down for the elder, you have to stay kneeling until they finish drinking the water. <laughs> and I said, I wasn't going to do that with my child. And so I told her categorically, this is, this is my own child. And I'm going to own this upbringing not the way that you want uh, uh, them to be brought up. And so that's the way uh, it has. So it has to first of all come with you accepting yourself and standing your ground and not caring what people say about you. Remember, people's opinion, whatever they say, their opinion of you is not uh, your, uh, your not own, uh, it's, it's not your reality. Yeah. It's their own uh, way. And then somebody talked to ask me uh, the issue of whether I teach. Yeah, I do teach. At one time I was being a, uh, there's this program I do, uh, Citizens Hub. I have an organization. I uh, do in the last few uh, months. I've not really uh, focused on it the way I should. That's what we even do with this call. We call Wealth is a Woman. It's actually, if you uh, if you use the hashtag Wealth is a Woman, you see a lot of things that we, we've talked about. Mm. And then when I find myself in places like this, I always say, I love to teach. It's For me, it's, it's one of the ways uh, that I, I love to, to learn.